Stephanie Beatriz, star of The Light of the Moon, a new film. Um, thank you for joining us here. Uh, I would venture to guess that most people know you from your very comedic turn in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Uh, yes. But this film uh, is much more dramatic than that. Um, you play a woman who is the victim of sexual assault, and it sort of explores the, really the aftershocks of that and how that one event um, infects the rest of her life. Yeah. So I was wondering, did you actively seek out something more dramatic to to do something different, or how did you come about this project? Yeah, I actually used to, before I booked Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I was mainly a theater actor. I was working in regional theater, which is like, um, I was working like all around the country. The last job that I had before I came to LA was at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and I was doing like Isabella and Measure for Measure, and uh, what else that season? Something else really heavy. I mean, I'm, I'm really like, that's sort of where I feel like I do the best, my best work. I feel most comfortable in sort of um, accessing places, like the dark sort of places that you don't really want to access in regular life. For some reason, that seems to be the thing that I like to do the most, which is like the scary, the the sort of vulnerable, the very um, tumultuous places in, in human beings' worlds. I sort of gravitate toward that work. So I really wanted to do something that was very, very different than what I've been doing on Brooklyn. And I was looking for something to sort of sink into in our um, in our hiatus time between seasons. And Light of the Moon came along and it was gonna be one month shoot in Brooklyn. And I was like, oh, this works perfectly. And then I read the script and I thought this is so immensely important mm -hmm. that I just wanted to do it right away. Um, yeah, the one thing that struck me about the movie um, is that mo a lot of times when you know sexual assault is depicted on film, we have like movie magic and we cut away yes. and we don't really see the rest. But it really stays on your character after the event. You know, yeah. everything from you know cleaning herself up and sitting at home alone waiting for a boyfriend and the hospital and everything that entails. Um, so, uh, was that intimidating for you as an actor uh, about getting into that headspace? I don't intimidating. No, it was it was terrifying because I felt you know when I read the script, I thought I'd never read anything quite like this because because of exactly what you said. I think most of the time in film and television, we see it's either a cutaway or it's this like very grotesque, um, super blown out and stylized uh, or like sexy version of a rape, you know, or it's this like really. Um, gratuitous and like and there's all these like shots that are usually used for sex scenes you know and I had never read anything like this script which is like completely from the survivor slash victim's perspective even the rape it's like mm -hmm. it's the camera's really just on her and how this thing is affecting her I think I didn't I didn't feel intimidated I more felt like a major sort of sense of like gosh I just want to get it somehow sort of recognizably right to someone who's actually gone through this um, I, my my hope would that would be that it it touches on something that feels real to actual real survivors of it mm -hmm. and that is what i that was i guess intimidating and terrifying and like a sense of like in a weird way like almost like social responsibility if that makes sense um mm -hmm. because i just haven't seen it done in my opinion i haven't really seen it done in a way that feels real and and i'm i think that that's also part of why i wanted to do this because jessica m thompson who wrote the script came from the world of documentary and like that sort of that's that sense of reality i feel like she really brought that to the way that the film was written and shot yeah i'm, I'm glad you brought up jessica m thompson um because we've noticed here at gold derby what a fantastic year for women on film it is, um, you know, when you have all these writers and directors, female writers and directors, nice. creating awesome work this year in all different forms. And she was the uh, writer, director, and I believe producer and editor as well. Yes. Um, and you also had, you know, a female cinematographer and production yes. designer on the team. So does that change the environment? Does that um, definitely affect the way the perspective was shot. I think so I mean, I I really think that I think that one of the things that was important to Jessica was to tell a story from from the not the perpetrator's point of view and not necessarily um, someone on the outside looking in, but to try to make it feel like you you as the audience are with Bonnie 
every step of the way. And that includes in that rape scene, that includes in the scenes afterwards when she's like, you know, for example, trying to have sex again for the first time. I think that um, our director of cinematography, Autumn Aiken, is immensely talented. And she sometimes really did feel like the third character in the room with us. And she had such a sense of ease with us as actors, with myself and Michael Saul David. And often in those scenes, she, the camera was here, like so close in a way that I'd never experienced before because on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, we've got three cameras and it's very, you know, it's like a different vibe completely. Autumn was like here, just with you all the time. And I, I, I would like to think that that's, that's a possibility for all cinematographers or all artists to be able to sort of be um, supportive of the work and a fly on the wall. I know that sometimes I've spoken to other actors that have had experiences with cinematographers or directors that don't treat them that way. That um, Andre Brower has this great thing where he'll he'll sort of say like, well, I'm not a meat puppet. Like if you wanted a meat puppet, you should have hired somebody else. And I think that's so great, right? Like it's just yeah. like straight and dirty way to say like, I, that's not what I do. Like I'm not, here to just do that. I want to collaborate and I want to find the real, real thing with you in this moment. And that is what Jess and Autumn do. That's what they bring to a set. I don't know, again, like I haven't experienced enough of filmmaking yet. This is really only the first lead that I've ever had in a film. So like I haven't been in the world yet enough to see the gnarly sides of it. I've been really lucky. I've worked for some really amazing people who respect me as an actor and as an artist. Um, but I know so many women in this industry that could say something very different. Yeah. Um, another great thing, maybe another way you're lucky, is with this role in Brooklyn Nine-Nine, um, you're a Latina actress, and the character is Latina, but it's not the sole descriptor of Yes. Her. She's a complicated, um, you know, three-dimensional character, which yes. unfortunately is so not the case often, unfortunately. It's still um, very rare, yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you encountered a lot of that in why why do you think that's rare in the industry i i do think it's still so much of this stuff comes from the top down and so if you're looking at the kinds of people who are sitting in the seats of we decide what movies get made we decide what movies get funded we decide how art is shaped because we have control of the money and the majority of those people are still they still look a certain way they still, um, you know, like to, to be honest, the majority of them are cisgendered white males. And so there is still this like lie. I really think it's a lie that we can't somehow identify with a culture or, or a person that doesn't look just like us. Um, I know it's a lie because I've been identifying with people that didn't look like me since I've been watching television because there wasn't anybody that looked like me. But I still felt deeply and laughed heartily at all of that stuff that I was watching, right? So I think it's some of it's fear, um, but I do think that the world is starting to slowly shift. I mean, you look at the opening of something like Coco, mm, like yeah. what did it do? Like 41 million in the second weekend in China. I mean, you, you, the lie is now crumbling because you can't tell me that like those people are just not going to buy tickets to that movie if they don't like sort of resemble what the idea of European standard of beauty is like that's a lie, you know? Yeah. But at the same time, like I, I have been sort of frustrated with like, I mean, the reviews of our film have been incredible. Like I don't want to toot my own horn, but like, damn, they've been pretty good. Like, <laughs> and, and it's not just, you know, like Poe down papers, it's like Hollywood Reporter and Variety. And you know, like it's these big, big, big names that are saying like this film is doing something wonderful and beautiful. And yet at the same time, like we're still sort of this like, this film is a complete underdog because it hasn't had like a big opening. It didn't, you know, like it sort of came to theaters and went and it really is going to take like people watching the screeners that are getting sent out now to sort of keep any kind of buzz still going about the film. And then we'll see what happens with the video on demand release in January. But like, it really is going to be word of mouth for this film because it's like, again, I, I, I don't want to say that it's because there's a Latina in the lead, but I'm, I'm curious about like what would have been the response if it had been someone that didn't look like me in the lead of the, in the lead of this movie, you know? Um, so what if, with that all in mind, um, I mean, it's kind of hard to watch this movie without thinking of all the sexual assault and harassment allegations yeah. that have rippled through Hollywood. 
Sure. Um, and especially, so what's it like for you to watch it being released at this specific time too? Because when you made it, it wasn't necessarily there. Is there something that you'd like people to take away from it specifically? I think generally, I think the thing that's happened now is that all of us are having more conversations about this, right? Like I'm sure you in your own life have had many conversations in the last couple of weeks about this. And those conversations that start with something like, did you read this thing? That those can sort of evolve to like, has this ever happened to you? Do you know anyone? Do you have anyone? Like, how can we be better allies? Like they just start, that starts the ball rolling, right? And then it, it also affects like how you look at how you are living your own life and whether or not you are being the best kind of, you know, human being you can be in this moment. Are you engaging in predatory behavior? Are you, are you judging victims of sexual assault? Are you, you know, it sort of pries open this Pandora's box, I guess, that we're all sort of, none of us really want to believe that we live in a rape culture. We all want to pretend that it's not really happening because it's so ugly. It's so ugly to look at. But I think at the core of the ugliness is also our ability to be better humans. And I think that that, for me, is the thing that I'm hopeful that this film does, is that starts conversations between people and allows them to see that like they do have power. They can be part of the sea change that is happening now in Hollywood and all over the world. Um, that would be my hope, that it, I mean, that it starts conversations between people and that maybe maybe there's a survivor that would be able to turn to someone and say like, do you want to go see this movie with me? Like, and maybe that is the beginning of something big for them. That's great. Um, well, looking at your other projects, the more comedic side, um, yes. on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, you also are, you know, a Latina who is one of uh, two on the show. Right. And uh, it's a very diverse cast. Yes. And I heard that you did not originally audition for Rosa. Uh, no, I did not. I went in for Amy at first. I, I read yeah. for Amy. And when I was in the audition, Allison Jones, who cast our show, has cast like all my favorite things. Um, side note, I was like, I couldn't believe that I was going in for Allison Jones. I was like, what is happening? This is amazing. Uh, she sort of said, she was like, hmm, you're a good actor. I, I think I want you to read this other part. And I was like, okay, you know. And she handed me this, the sides for this role, Megan. And at the time, the role was Megan, and it didn't have any sort of uh, ethnic descriptors at all. Um, Megan was just in the script. She was just like tough, smart, and scary as hell. And um, then I ended up doing a screen test for both the role of Amy and the role of Megan. And uh, and then I didn't hear anything for a little while. And then Melissa got cast. And then I was like, well, I guess that's it because they're not. They're not gonna cast two of us on one network show, you know. There's no way. There's no way. And then there is a way. So it was a really amazing, amazing moment in my life. Yeah, and the whole cast is incredible with Andre Brower and Andy Samberg. Thanks. Um, and, yeah, they're great people. And you know, because we're an awards site, we keep track of these things. And you guys were all nominated for the SAG uh, Ensemble in the Comedy Series yeah. uh, a few years ago. Um, was it, you know, really? I imagine it's a nice thing to have that together as a group. Yeah. Um, what And it's really, when you watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine, it just seems like everyone is having so much fun. And obviously the SAG nominators agreed. So what do you think makes your ensemble so fun to watch? I mean, I think one of the unsung heroes is Alison Jones, because I think casting is such a, and it's a, the work of an alchemist, right? Like she's, she's really, she sees something in people and she's like able to put together a team, you know, like, like a really good GM on a, on a baseball team or something. Like that's what she is capable of doing. I also think again, the idea that things come from the top down, like when you work with, for somebody like Andy, who is like super feminist, super smart, just like a, a champion of like all people, not just women, but like just all people that you're coming into an environment in which you feel seen, heard, respected, um, and you feel like you are part of the thing, right? You don't feel like I'm dispensable or like disposable, I could just be replaced. You feel, you feel like the reason this thing works well is because you were here, you know? And that I think is the, so valuable to an actor because let's face it, we're very, we're very insecure, vulnerable, little people right and that's also why we're able to tap into all this stuff but what that means is that we really need like a flower to the sun we need that sort of reassurance that 
what we're doing is on the right track. And mm -hmm. I think Andy and Dan Gore and Mike Schur and everyone at Fox and Universal, they really give us that. They make us feel like, like, yeah, do your weird, funny, wholesome, lighthearted, but also slightly woke thing. Yeah, yeah, go do it, you know? And that that makes us feel like a team. And also, it's just, I think it's like the personalities of people, you know, like, Terry Crews is such a great, wonderful human being to be around. Mm -hmm. Chelsea Peretti is so funny and smart and witty. Joe Latrulio is the best. He's just, like, the greatest human. Melissa Fumero is just, like, she's just an, an incredible, an incredible, like, beast of a woman. She's amazing, you know, like... Everyone. I mean, Andre, the, even like Dirk and Joel, who I think are just don't get enough screen time period, I think are just the most generous human being. I mean, everyone is so great. Like there's no, there's nobody that I'm like, Oh God, I have to work with them this week. You know? <laughs> it feels good to go to work. Yeah. I mean, you're pretty lucky with the amount of people and I shouldn't leave out your cast members for Light of the Moon because there's Conrad Ricamora and, you know, yes. Tony nominee, um, Olga Marides. And yes. do you have a wish list of other people you want to work with? Like, do you pitch guest stars to the Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Yeah, yeah, we definitely pitch. I definitely pitch, you know. Um, actually, uh, it's funny that you mentioned Olga. She, I loved working with her so much on Light of the Moon that there's an episode coming up, I believe it airs December 12th, but um, there's an episode coming up where they were like, we'd like to cast your parents. And I was like, here's who I'd like. I would like <laughs> Olga Meredith is my mother and then Danny Trejo as my father because I thought that would be so spot on for Rosa. Like, that makes complete sense that she came from that world, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely other people that I would just love to work with someday, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I think Jimmy Smith was on my list and I definitely didn't get any scenes with him. I'm so sad, but um, there's people like that I just respect and admire their work so much. And I've actually had, I've had, I've had a very lucky career in that, like, if it wasn't on film, it was in, on stage that I got to work with some of my heroes. Like, I did a play for five, six months with Katherine Coulson, who played the log lady. Oh, awesome. And she was an angel. And it was a dream come true to be, like, on stage with her every night. It was incredible. So, like, I've been very, very lucky. I can't wait to work with more actors. Great. Well, uh, one question before we wrap up here. Um, because you have this split of, you know, the dramatic and comedic work, is there, and you mentioned that you have your roots more in the drama side. Does that mean the comedy is more difficult to you? What do you, do you see that as more of a challenge? I do find it challenging in a different way. I, I'm not, I'm not, I still break out into a cold sweat when the director says like, now just improvise for a little bit. And I get sort of like, ah, I really like to have a, a framework for the thing that I'm doing. Um, so I still find it the more sort of challenging personally for for me. That being said, I feel like I've learned a lot on the show. I've been around some really amazingly talented people, so I feel less terrified of it than I did before. And I don't know, I think I sit somewhere like, I think I sit somewhere in the middle, you know, like I'm, I have like one foot in one, the other foot in the other. And that, even though that feels sort of like precarious, it also feels like the best place to live. Great. Well, I have to let you go, but thank you so much for uh, sitting with us. And thank you. And I can't wait to see uh, Danny Trejo and Olga as your parents. Oh, up. Get ready. It's going to be a great up. Um, so we'll watch Tuesdays uh, on Fox for Brooklyn nine, nine and congratulations on the light of the moon. It's really thank tremendous you. work. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you.